Hello everybody and thank you for tuning in to the Progressive Parent YouTube channel. I'm very privileged this evening to have um, Pete Gerlach on the line. I hope I pronounced that correctly. How did I do? Pretty close. Pete Gerlach. He is the author of the self-help website, the Break the Cycle self-help website, and you can find that at www.sfhelp.org. He did his master's in social work and spent 40 years of training people in interpersonal communication, over 30 years of experience as a professional therapist, and 19 of those years doing inner family therapy. Um, inner family therapy is quite a recent model, isn't it? Yes, um, it is. Maybe you could tell, some, tell us a little bit about what inner family therapy is all about. Um, sure, let me try and uh, net it out. <clears throat> um, it's founded on this, this, is, this type of therapy is founded on the idea, which is actually ancient, but it's pretty unknown. The idea is that human personalities are composed of what can be called subcells or parts. Um, what that means is that most of us have been trained to think we have one personality, which is kind of monolithic. Um, this brand of thought says, no, our personalities actually are composed of a group of different talented subcells that can be likened to the members of an orchestra or a sports team. Each subself has a unique function. And so if you look at a personality that way, you can say, uh, my, com my personality really is an inner family of these subcells. And that leads to all kinds of interesting questions like, well, who are my subcells? Where did they come from? What do they do? How do they get along with each other? What if they don't? And most importantly, who yeah. is leading your inner family? So I could go on and on, uh, Anthony, but that's a quick thumbnail about what is an inner family. Inner family therapy uses the principles of family therapy with, with physical human beings, you know, which says, let's get mom, dad, and the kids, Uncle George, and Aunt Sophia in the same room, and with a skilled therapist, let's work to harmonize them and solve their problems. Um, inner family therapy uses exactly the same principles, except now, instead of physical people, uh, you, meaning any of us, can direct um, the dynamics and change the dynamics. Once you get to know them, you can change the dynamics of your subcells so they behave more harmoniously, and most importantly, so they follow the wise leadership of one subself in particular, which can be called the true self. In my experience, the true self um, makes wise short-term and long-term decisions and has all the traits that the best of human leaders have. True self sets goals, devises plans, solves problems, and brings out the best in all the other subcells if he or she is allowed to do so. So inner family therapy is all about learning who uh, com who comprises your personality, who is in there, who are they, what do they do, and if they're not harmonious, how can you make them more harmonious? I can say much more, but that's kind of an outline. Yes, um, in fact, you wrote a fantastic book on that subject called Who's Really Running Your Life, and I got that from Amazon, and um, I really enjoyed uh, what I've read so far, which is maybe about half of the text. Okay. So, one could say in um, the same way that as a communication coach, you would teach families to get on better. As an inner family ther therapist, you teach people to improve their psyche by learning how to get on with themselves better. And I use with themselves better in the most ambiguous way. As, <laughs> you know, we always um, refer to people as themselves um, ironically. 
So one thing, this this channel is um, so obviously to help parents improve their resources and the tools in their box for dealing their family, with their family. And you identified, or the internal family systems model identifies six wounds that children can receive during their upbringing if their needs are not met in a judicious fashion. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about these six wounds. What sort of things causes each of them? Or maybe we can get to that question next. And then, yeah, and we'll take it from there. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question, uh, Anthony. That's central um, to interfamily therapy and my website, which is like you, dedicated to helping parents do a better job. Um, my opinion, after 33 years of studying human behavior and family dynamics and many other things, my clinical opinion is when children in their first years, meaning zero through five or six, roughly, if they have a group of developmental needs, they depend entirely on the adults that are supervising and caring for them. And if the adults are psychologically wounded themselves, which I'll explain in a minute, and if parents are not aware of the parenting process and their children's specific needs, and if they don't know how to meet their, their children's needs, they provide inadequate parenting. When that happens, sometimes it can be said that the children experience um, psychological or physical abandonment, neglect, and or abuse. All three of those, or any mix of them, can be called trauma. When young children, zero through six, more or less, experience some version of trauma like this from their uh, adults, who almost always never intend to do this, <clears throat> but they don't know how to do it better, when children experience such trauma, they slash we uh, develop, as you said, up to six psychological wounds. As kids' brains are forming and their personalities are beginning to coalesce, um, they inherit, in my opinion, this is my own judgment, um, first of all, they, the sub-cells that start to coalesce and form their personalities are disorganized. There is no internal leader, and so the subcells, in the service of trying to survive, <clears throat> the subcells become used to running their own show, so to speak. They don't follow anybody else if the parents' true selves are not in charge. So the first of six wounds is a significantly disorganized, leaderless personality that starts to form. Over um, the developmental years, through teenage and young adulthood, these subcells coalesce and they become used to guiding the host person and they often distrust or don't even know there is a resident true self in place. That's the first wound. It causes a mix of up to five additional psychological wounds. Uh, they are briefly these excessive, as opposed to normal, excessive shame, which is often called low self-esteem, excessive shame, and excessive guilt. I lump those two together, even though they are uh, caused by different things, and they have different uh, solutions. But putting them together, I lump them as the second type of psychological wound that many vulnerable young kids inherit excessive shame, and excessive guilt. Guilt is the feeling, I've done something wrong. Shame is the feeling, I am something wrong. I'm unlovable, I'm flawed, I'm no good, I'm stupid, I'm ugly, I'm dumb. That is a crippling belief that infests, as far as I know, a high percentage of normal people. Yeah, absolutely, it's endemic. Um, so... Uh, disorganized personality, excessive shame and guilt, a companion wound, which is also epidemic, I'm afraid, is excessive fear. 
that's called that's on a, a continuum of uh, unease to anxiety to fear to outright terror. But people who are raised in low nurturance childhoods, meaning they didn't get their needs met well enough, grow up with a number of significant excessive, not normal, excessive fears. That can include fear of the unknown, fear of failure, fear of, believe it or not, fear of success, um, fear of fear, fear of not being normal, fear of rejection, all kinds of fears. Most of us have fears. They serve a useful purpose. When they are excessive, they cripple us. So that's a third type of inherited wound in families where parents are themselves wounded and unaware. A fourth wound is excessive reality distortion. There are several different forms of that, but the most popular is denial. Uh, that's a type of reality distortion. Wounded people, when confronted with the possibility that they inherited psychological wounds, say, me? You're crazy. My brother did, but not me. Uh-uh, no, no. If people say you come from a very dysfunctional family, wounded people, until they start recovery, say, you're nuts. My family was absolutely normal. I had a wonderful childhood. I personally felt that until I was age 46. The lights went on for me, um, which is a story by itself, but I suddenly recognized that I had been raised by two functional alcoholics um, who did not know how to parent at all, and we were normal, I thought. Yes, we were. We were normally dysfunctional. Anyway, reality distortion is another major wound that kids accrue in low nurturance families where parents are unaware and wounded. Another wound is difficulty trusting. Many of us, and I use the term grown wounded child, or GWC, many of us GWCs have trouble learning who to trust and who not to trust. That includes difficulty trusting our own judgment and, for some of us, difficulty trusting that there is a benevolent, accessible, responsive, higher power available to us. That's, of course, a debatable subject for many people, but the main theme is difficulty trusting. Many of us DWCs trust too easily, and we wind up getting betrayed and disappointed and frustrated, and then we blame ourselves. The other group of us DWCs don't trust people who really do merit our trust. We are chronically suspicious. <clears throat> if you put all these wounds together, disorganized personality, excessive shame and guilt, excessive fears, excessive uh, reality distortions, trust disorders. Some unfortunate GWCs have all of those, and in my experience, what that often leads to is a sixth wound, which is especially tragic. It seems to be an inability to empathize with other people and to feel, give, and receive love. Such people are perpetually isolated, alone, lonely, depressed, sad, and they feel like outsiders, even in the middle of a crowd that accepts them. They don't know how to accept it or feel that. So that's a very quick summary of six wounds that I believe parents unwittingly pass on to their children because they, the parents, got the wounds from their parents. These wounds, in my judgment, pass down the generations until parents wake up uh, or until young, young people wake up as adults and say, I've been wounded, I'm going to heal these wounds, and I am definitely not going to pass them on to my kids. Let me pause for breath here. I just gave you a long speech here. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you. So that that sixth and final wound, the really tragic wound, which is, so to say, uh, an inability to give love in a way that it's received and receive love in the way that it was intended to be given, 
do you think that's the primary source of wounding children? Uh, I wouldn't say that, <clears throat> Anthony. I would say the primary source of these wounds is a disorganized personality, and, and the host person doesn't know that they are being ruled what, by what can be called a false self. Uh, just briefly, uh, your true self and mine and every uh, person who looks at your channel, everybody has, in my judgment, a true self who makes naturally wise decisions. However, when some other sub cells who from childhood, they didn't have a true self to rely on because at that time, the uh, embryonic true self didn't know much about the world. So other sub cells had to make do in order to survive, and they got used to making the host person's decisions. Um, as the host person grows into adulthood, their true self gains valuable uh, world knowledge and becomes an exceptionally able leader. However, other sub-cells don't trust the true self, and they will not listen to him or her, and they, quote, take him over or her over. So, for example, um, if you have uh, a, a sub-self that says, I have a number of important tasks I need to get done today, you may have, as many of us do, including me, you may have a protective sub-self called the procrastinator. Um, his case, for us males, his, uh, his mission, I should say, is to make sure that we don't uh, fail. He's protecting our inner kids who are ashamed and guilty and afraid. So the procrastinator... <coughs> says, no, 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 I don't think it's safe for us to balance the checkbook or get petrol in the car or pay the taxes or go to work on time or various other things. And the procrastinator takes us over, and we think and feel like this particular sub-self. We lose the wise, balanced judgment of our true self. So guess what? Our behavior uh, looks like, to an outside observer, that we put off doing important uh, tasks. And then when somebody says, gee, uh, you, you were supposed to do X, Y, Z, but you deferred and you put that off until next week, we have another uh, popular sub-self, a guardian sub-self, who says, yes, but here are the reasons, here's why. Many of us have a very, very clever protective sub-self that can be called the magician. He or she is the source of our reality distortion. Anyway, I can go on and on and on, but those are just two examples of yes. how some cells take us over. And I think, to answer your question, the major problem that kids and young adults have is they are ruled by what can be called a false self, and they have no clue. They don't know that's happening. They don't know what it's causing or what causes it and they're ignorant, and they often wind up making very, very poor choices in school and in life and in relationships. Um, so false selves, in my judgment, are the major source of most personal and social problems. So, yes, yeah, some of these sub-selves, if I'm not mistaken, are either formed as a reaction to or as an internalization of the parents. So one example that I've sort of seen come about in, in others or in myself is a harsh inner critic, which is a reflection of one or both of the parents. Yes, sir. So, so for example, if someone felt like they might never have been good enough no matter what they tried, they might have a particularly active procrastinator who thinks, well, it's better not to bother swimming at all because, you know, if I drown, at least I can say, well, hey, I wasn't really trying. <laughs> That's a good example. The, the other thing I would say is that um, harsh inner critic, in a way, is 
was originally formed as a defense mechanism. So if you like, the the inner mom is there to protect you from the outer mom. If you criticize yourself, you can anticipate what you're about to be criticized for, and you know maybe move the shoes out of the hall. Oh, I'm such an idiot! I moved the shoes. Out. I left the shoes in the hall. Uh, close the window upstairs, or I could get into trouble from that, and um, make sure the cat's out. All the things you could possibly potentially be criticised for. By internalising the critic, you um, reduce the risk of being attacked from the outside by having by self-attacking. So, do you think that people can maybe give themselves credit for? creating a useful sub-self to help them overcome a traumatic environment and start saying to themselves, well, you know, I did what I had to do, but now that particular um, defense mechanism is, is no longer necessary, so, so maybe we can go about deactivating it. Well, um, I appreciate your question. It's very uh, logical and you're very clear as you frame that. Um, the inner critic um, is one who vexes and causes a great deal of stress in most of us. Uh, and I think your description is accurate, uh, Anthony, about saying uh, the inner critic is formed internalizing from criticism from parents and other adults. Um, so it's sort of like when the parents are gone, we continue to criticize ourselves just the way our parents did. They Hopefully they meant well, and so does your inner critic. The one thing that I would um, shift from what you just said is if you realize you are protecting yourself by over-criticizing yourself, you can then say, I don't need this criticism. That is good in theory. In practice, most people cannot change their subcells through willpower alone. Right. That's why, that's why bad habits exist. I mean, people nail biting or smoking or over drinking or working out too little or too much uh, or addictions of various sorts. We all know we're not supposed to do that. We know it's not healthy, and yet we do it anyway. And the logic by itself is of little or no value in getting sub cells to change. That is specifically why inner family therapy is useful, because it is a technique where anybody who is motivated and who gathers the knowledge <clears throat> that you are, anybody can learn, get this, how to converse with individual some cells and persuade them to change. That's a lot different than just thinking, well, I don't need my inner critic so much anymore. What you do in inner family therapy is sit quietly, meditate, focus on your inner critic, invite, it, invite your inner critic to give you an image in case she or he will do so, and have a, a structured conversation with this image in your mind. This sounds pretty far out to most people until they actually experience it. Um, Imagine if the inner critic became physical and was walking alongside of you as you conduct your life. Get up in the morning, get dressed, go about your business, come home, go to bed, and your inner critic is walking right alongside of you all, all day long. And you found that this um, incessant criticism was really pretty wearing and discouraged all your other sub -cells. Uh, lowered your self-esteem and inhibited your productivity and caused you not to take some safe risks, all kinds of, you know, bad results. What would you say to this physical embodiment of the inner critic, of, of the critic, in case it was a physical person? You'd have a dialogue with that one, and hopefully you'd say, I appreciate you trying to help me, but what I need you to know is the way you're trying to help me is actually hindering me. So I'd like you to change the way you're trying to help me. I can go on and on and on with this, Anthony, but yeah. I basically I want to agree with what you just said with the one shift that you can't, once you recognize some some cells are harming you, you can't just think them away. That doesn't work. Yeah. So in the same way that you might negotiate with um, a close friend or um, a family member, 
um, who cared about you say, you know, I know you're trying to help, but it would much, it would be much preferable to me if you, if you know, you talk to me this way rather than the way you're talking to me. And I know, you know, a lot of parents say things like, oh, I just lose it, you know, I, I, and I hear myself speaking the way that my parents spoke to me, to my children, yes. and I don't want to speak to them that way, but right. it just kind of comes out. So that would be something that's very familiar to some people, and I guess you would say in that particular moment they're merged with a particular sub who has that habit pattern of speaking, which they internalized from their upbringing. So, exactly. So, um, could you say a little bit about what things cause some of the wounds that we've discussed? What kinds of actions cause maybe each of them or some of them, so that people have an idea of certainly what kind of actions to have <clears throat> when it, and and how they might inadvertently wound or you know, advertently take an action that they don't realize they're taking, which could lead to a wound? That's that's a great question. I appreciate it. Um, let me try and be brief, because I can do probably a four hours on that one. Um, the, the one that, in my opinion, is most obvious is when adults who are busy and distracted and trying to, you know, build a healthy family and, and survive and earn enough money and have friends and take care of their relatives and their aging parents and their pets and their home. Parents have a lot on their plates. Um, if by nature or by over busyness, they ignore a young child, meaning two, three, four years old. Um, if the child is crying and the adult says, oh, shut up, that brings, that builds several wounds. One is, oh, I'm no good. Uh, that is the roots of shame. <clears throat> Another is, it's not safe to cry or to call for help. That breeds distrust. Um, um, if a parent says, though however well-intentioned the parent might be, you knocked over your milk again. You're so clumsy. Why do you keep doing that? The child um, learns, I'm bad. And she, the child, also learns, I broke mama's rule. Because mama says, never spill your milk. And I, I didn't mean to, but I was excited and I was turning to look at my brother. And I knocked my milk over. I broke a rule and therefore, I'm bad. That's where excessive shame and excessive guilt come from. If you multiply those simple examples yes. by hundreds of small behaviors that parents do automatically because they're focused on lots of different things, and they're not aware of their own process, and they frankly don't know what they're doing in some cases. If you multiply those simple knock-the-milk-over or oh, be quiet um, examples. A horrendous example is, in my judgment, spanking. I am um, a very strong advocate of firm discipline for kids. Kids need rules, they need guidance, but the way discipline is provided um, can be enormously damaging, in my opinion. Many people would disagree with this. Um, physically striking a child to try and get them to obey you or to bring home the point, you've got to listen to me and you have to understand this is really important to me. That breeds shame, distrust, and fear, and it teaches a child the way to get people to cooperate is to cause them pain. Um, actions like that, which and, and often, I don't believe parents wake up in the morning saying, how can I wound my child? They don't. They're trying their best. They really are. And often they were not taught by their own parents how to parent effectively. 
Um, <laughs> be careful. I can go on a great length. Well, I, 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 I love hearing you speak. Oh, you're so passionate and erudite. I mean, spanking is certainly something that makes me very angry. We, we don't spank our spouses or our employees or our employers or our waiter. If the waiter's not on time, you don't say, well, that'll teach you never to um, bring my food late. And obviously now we're at the point in society where there's such a great body of evidence. 93% of studies agree that spanking is harmful to children. The only potential benefit that they could see was it gains immediate compliance. Now, right. so would putting a gun to someone's head, but that doesn't necessarily mean that immediate compliance is a virtue. In fact, in the long term, it can create chronic defiance in children. And on top of all the downsides of using physical violence as a means of trying to teach a child, it's also, of course, what you're not doing when you're spanking, which is taking the opportunity to understand the needs underlying the child's behavior and negotiate. And by negotiating with your children, you're teaching them how to negotiate, how to reason, how to empathize with other people. If you take actions such as hitting, what you're saying is, you don't want to do this because of the consequences to you, as opposed to, you don't want to do this because it has negative consequences to other people. So, I can see how your example of sort of criticizing for little mistakes, like knocking over the milk, and things like that could create a chronic fear in people of making mistakes and the kind of attitude of paralysis where, oh, I can't do anything because if I make a mistake, I might get scolded or, or I'm bad. Those are some examples of how we can win. Um, there's uh, ignoring a child, being overly critical, using physical violence as a form of discipline. And what are the most important things that parents should know that it's important to teach their kids, which will avoid wounding them and edify them? Oh, um, that's a big question. I know. Uh, sorry, I'm just I'm just going for the really big ones here. Oh, that's great. I, you're, you're doing a great job of asking questions, Anthony. I really admire your thinking and what you're trying to do. I, I think you and I are singing from the same hymn book here. Um, in my judgment, if someone wants to be a parent before they ever conceive a child, in my highly biased opinion, they ought to check themselves to see if they inherited psychological wounds. Because if they did, despite their best of intentions, they are likely to A, pick a wounded partner, and B, Two wounded people who are unaware of their wounds will conceive a child and probably did not inherit healthy rules for parenting, and they inadvertently, underline inadvertently, will pass on wounds to their children without meaning to. So the best thing that parents can do before conception is check themselves honestly and say, did I inherit psychological wounds? And if I did, I better reduce them in order to A, pick a minimally wounded parent, a, a partner, and B, if my partner and I decide to have children, my partner should check herself or himself for wounds also. So if we can minimize our wounds and reduce them, we give our unborn children the very best chance to grow up uh, with a label, this is my label, a grown, nurtured child, a GXC. That's the biggest thing, in my biased opinion, that parents can do. If they have children without doing this, if they say, oh no, we never knew about this, so we have children, and now what can we do? My answer remains the same. Run, do not walk to the nearest source of assessment, which is what my free website is about and my book, as you know. That's www.sfhelp.org. That's right. S is in Sam, F is in Frank, 
H-E-L-P is in Paul, sfhelp.org. The S-L-F originally stood for Step Families, by the way. I just haven't that's, changed it. But. That's right. You did a lot of work with Step Families, including write, writing a book. Yes, I, I, I have written several books, and Lesson 7 in my website is all about Step Families. I spent many, many years studying that particular type of family. I'm a step everything myself, which is probably part of my motivation. Uh, but uh, in any event, people, adults who raise children in step families have a whole host of special challenges that parents in biologically intact families do not have. Step family parenting is incredibly complicated, um, at least in the United States. I don't know about Europe or your country, but it's estimated that over 50% of American step family couples break up. Um, and that's a whole separate subject, which is off your theme here. But in any event, uh, you originally asked, what, what can parents do uh, to minimize the chance of passing on these wounds? And the first, very first thing is assess yourself. And if you have wounds yourself, it's not a source of shame. You're not bad. You're not wrong. Neither were your parents. They really tried their best, just like you are. I'm talking to parents now. But for heaven's sakes, take responsibility for putting your true self in charge. And then teach your children how to do that. Yeah, one thing I've definitely noticed from dealing with friends and associates who had um, difficult childhoods is it can tragically create such a low expectancy of behavior that they're willing to receive in relationships, either romantically or friendship-wise. And, you know, people will say to them things like, you know, well, why are you with him if he's, you know, so nasty to you? And why are you with her if she criticizes you all the time? But it runs so deep because they're not really used to receiving any better treatment from their home environment. And so they don't, in one hand, they're desensitized to it. and another hand, they're used to it because it feels familiar. And on, on the third hand, if we had a third hand, they don't feel like they're worth any better. So I, I, I I've like, had so many conversations with people where I just really wanted to empathize with them and denormalize their childhood. And I think that's really important for people to realize who had a difficult time growing up, if they received poor treatment, even if their parents did the best they could to acknowledge that that wasn't ideal, that wasn't an ideal circumstance to be in, and they deserve, they can get better if they choose to get better from relationships as adults and to not look on the, the, the behavior they received as normal. Because if they do, then they stand two risks. One is getting in the same kinds of relationships as adults, be they friendships or romantic relationships, or professional relationships, you know, with a difficult boss, an abusive boss. The second risk they run if they normalize it is obviously repeating the abuse on other people. So it's really important to get up and, you know, if you were, if you were hit, say, um, okay, I was hit, that's, that may be common, but it's not normal. It's not a nurturing environment. So it's not okay to hit or be hit. Okay, I was really badly very criticized. Um, that's, that's not, that's not a reflection of my shame, you know? That wasn't a reflection of me that I was very heavily criticized. It was a reflection of that was the only way that my parents or primary caregivers or teachers knew of trying to motivate me to meet their standards. If they'd known more constructive ways of motivating me to meet their standards, maybe they would have spoken to me in that way instead. And so forth with all those kinds of situations which create wounds. Denormalize it. Don't just think 
that's just the way it is, that's the way to bring up a child. Acknowledge, and that's what I'm a really big fan, like of yourself, of people improving the way they communicate, and you wrote a great book on that called Satisfaction. Um, another one that I think is a great book on improving communication is a book called Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. And when I practiced that for several months, I definitely saw an improvement in the level of honesty and intimacy in my relationships. Because when I brought to the relationship this thing, which is if anyone does something that rubs me off the wrong way, I just let them know very sensitively I felt hurt or angry or upset when you said or did this. I'm not blaming you for it, I'm just making you aware. And then it opens up a dialogue. What's more, you empower people in the relationship to know that if they have a problem with you, you're more than happy for them to take it up with you politely and that increases the level of intimacy in the relationship. I'm impressed by, by what you have become aware of and what you're doing. Um, I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, first, I totally agree, uh, Anthony, with what you're saying about uh, learning how to communicate effectively. Um, I am probably berserk on that subject, and I would add, incidentally, to your former question about what can parents do, um, one of the greatest gifts, in my judgment, that any parent can provide for their child or children is to learn the seven communication skills that are not taught in most schools and in very few families. Um, so I strongly endorse the value of effective communication, and I think both books that you mentioned, my own and Rosenberg's, which I haven't read, but I've heard lots of good things about it, um, are useful ways of learning how to communicate. Most parents don't know how to problem solve, in my opinion. Uh, what they do instead is model for their children either avoiding, denying, arguing, fighting, blaming, uh, running away, exaggerating, monologuing, Typical parents who were never taught to communicate effectively model those things for their children, and unless there is a mentor on the scene somewhere who knows really how to communicate effectively, the kids are going to grow up hobbled by not knowing how to communicate themselves. Um, the second thing I, I react to in what you just said is you're, you uh, predicated your ideas, I think, um, saying if you if you can communicate effectively with other people in general, co-workers, neighbors, relatives, and children, um, and if you report to them factually how their behavior affects you, that may open up a dialogue that can be constructed between you and the other person. However, here's the here's the point I want to make. Frequently, if the other person is governed by a false self. Your attempt to provide them with honest, respectful information about their behavior will cause them, because they're shame-based or fear-based or guilt-based, it will cause them to numb out, to misperceive you, to defend themselves, to attack you, to withdraw. They won't problem-solve unless they are aware of their true self and their other sub-selves will allow the true self to lead. So I agree totally with the, your idea, but please be aware, it takes two people who both have their true selves in charge to have the productive process that you described take place. Yes. Otherwise, it won't. There, and there's various um, ways that you can improve your chances of getting through to someone and various yeah. ways you can make it very difficult. Obviously, if you blame or shame or any or take any tone that would put someone on the defensive, you minimize your chances of getting your needs met. Right. If you can, obviously, speak from I, I felt when such and such happened, you have a greater chance. And you have a greater chance still if you've learned the art of empathizing with someone, even if they're angry or frustrated or upset, a great uh, technique 
for doing that is just to paraphrase what people have said back to them in a sentence and put a feeling word for on top of it. So that looks like, are you feeling angry because such and such? Or um, did you feel frustrated when I said that because you think that I'm saying you are aggressive? Or, you know, that, that when people hear that you understand them and can empathize with them, a lot of the time the intensity of their emotion drops and they're more willing to hear you. Exactly. And, and I, I always try and teach that approach to as many people as possible who are having interpersonal problems because I think of all the techniques, or I prefer to call them approaches because technique sounds very clinical. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Of all the approaches I've learned in communication, I think that's the one that managed to help me increase the level of intimacy and understanding in my relationships the most, which is a practical approach to empathizing. Of course, if you can get these kinds of results with your friends and family members, what you stand to gain is great because everyone, you don't need to worry that you've hurt or offended or upset people all the time because you know that they know that they've got your back and they can, they know that they can raise a criticism with you without you going on the defensive as long as they do it respectfully. So if people are willing to engage in learning how to communicate better, they stand to gain a lot out of improving their relationships and passing on those communication skills to their children because the reason why people communicate so poorly is they've been given a very poor model and so they from their environment and so if they want to improve the way they communicate they need to go to books or YouTube or you know a cha channel like yours or indeed your website and um, to learn those skills uh, just, sorry would you like to quick comment, on, on, what said? Quick comment on what you just said um, I share your 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 view on um, teaching people or encouraging them to learn communication. Um, my word is techniques um, or approaches. Um, my experience is that the vast majority of normal men and women um, are unaware how much they could improve their communication. Therefore, they're not motivated to even study it. Most people can say, pass the salt, you know, how much is that sweater, um, where is Aunt Susie? Most people can uh, accomplish routine communications, quote, well enough. Yes, they have fights. Yes, they have arguments. But in my experience, and I've been studying this for 40 years, most people have no clue that they are communicating at, at perhaps 50% of the effectiveness that they could have. They don't know what you just said, and which I totally agree with, by the way, Anthony, and they're not motivated to study or learn. Therefore, typical parents like that are not motivated to teach their kids. It's, I, it's a great frustration for me. because I, I've done a lot of therapy uh, with couples in my, in my time, and I would say perhaps less than 5% of typical men and women or partners knew how to problem solve. Uh, if you say, can you tell me the, how to describe the process of problem solving? Most people cannot. Uh, I, I don't know if you can because you're paying attention to it, I think. But <clears throat> people are unaware. That's the biggest problem of all. Usually my approach to um, problem solving, and I'm sure there's a lot you can teach us and I'm going to ask you to do that in a moment, is to fully understand where the other person is coming from uh -huh. by using reflective listening and then um, allow them to understand where I'm coming from. And usually by the process of people having their feelings, wants, needs, and goals out on the table, a synergy can arise where either um, we can think of a new solution which takes account of both our needs rather than arguing over who's so what and why, 
Um, or someone feels just because they've been heard well, just because they've been heard well, they, they have such good will that they're willing to um, compromise. If their true self is in charge. Sure. So you Many can, people, that's not enough for people who are run by a false self. But I agree with what, once again, I agree with you. So perhaps you could teach us something more about problem solving. Oh, yeah. Um, how about this? Um, I'm an ex-engineer, and that, in part, leads me to question everything. Like, you know, so I've asked myself, um, well, what is a problem? Between, between two people, what is this thing called a problem? What is that? Um, where I've come to rest on this, or currently anyway, I believe, human behavior is caused steadily by our drive to fill needs, N-E-E-D-S, needs. Um, a need is a discomfort, a physical or psychological, emotional, or even a spiritual discomfort. All of us, all humans and other animals, we are needy. We have needs all the time, meaning we have discomforts. Our life is a constant battle to reduce our discomforts and improve our comforts or pleasures. I think Dr. Freud was right about that point. So if you if you look at people who are arguing or have a dispute or disagree with each other, a place to start, just as you said, I really endorse what you said, um, not only find out what the other person is feeling, my uh, proposal is ask them what they need. So that sounds like looking at the other person in the eye, being quiet, being empathic as best you can, if you can, and saying, can you help me understand what you need right now in general, and what do you need from me? In order to answer that question, people need to have developed personal awareness. In my judgment, many, many people do not have awareness, and they can't honestly answer the question. What do I need? Well, I need things to get better. I know, but what's preventing things from being better? Anyway, um, problem solving to me is listening empathically and non-judgmentally to what the other person needs, getting as clear as possible, and then saying back to them what you think. So you need uh, to be able to use the car to get to the dentist this afternoon by 3 o'clock. Yes, that's right. That's what I need. And then I say, well, I need the car also in order to uh, fill an appointment with the tax attorney. So we both need the car. How can we solve this? Um, the second part of problem solving is getting clear on what you need as opposed to the other person. And something that's very useful and in my experience very few people understand is needs come in levels. There are surface needs, intermediate needs, and primary needs. Example, the need to get to the dentist by 3 o'clock. No, the need to have the car. That's a surface need. I need the car this afternoon. That's a surface need. Well, why do you need the car? Well, I need to get somewhere. I know. Where do you need to get? Well, I need to get to the dentist. Why do you need to get to the dentist? Well, I need to be on time so I can get my teeth worked on. And why do you need to get your teeth worked on? Well, so I can make this pain go away. So you really need the car this afternoon in order to make the pain go away. That's great. That's, 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 a, that's one of the seven communication skills called digging down. I would add that to your definition of problem solving. If you find out what the other person needs and then use digging down to get down to the real need and then dig down with your own needs, now... If the other person is willing to do this process with you, now you each know what you each need. The final step in problem solving is saying cooperatively and with mutual respect, if time allows, how can we both get enough of our real needs met now? And then you start to brainstorm. One of my favorite examples of brainstorming real quickly is a true story about a Canadian farmer 
who um, raised cows by uh, a major highway. And he had the bright idea of hanging advertisements on the sides of his cows, saying, you know, Farmer Jones uh, raises great cows and makes quality milk. The local officials came by and said, you can't do that. You're violating a municipal code that says you can't have a billboard on your property next to a public highway. And the farmer thought about that. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm telling the story wrong. He put up a billboard, first of all. They came by and said, you can't do that. That's wrong. And he did some problem solving and brainstorming, and he came up with the idea of putting signs on his cows. That's so and to me, that's thinking outside the box. And yes, you know, yes, he, achieved, yes. he filled his needs in a way that filled the needs of the local officials. That, to me, is creative problem solving. Yeah, that's really funny. It reminds me of another example I heard where an airport was getting terrible complaints because they took too long to get the baggage off the planes. So what they did was they rearranged the corridor in the airport so that when people got off the plane they had a 10 minute walk to baggage reclaim. Now the time it took them to get the luggage off the plane was just the same, but because people weren't standing about idle they didn't have the need to complain that they were, that they were bored, which I thought was a, a really creative way around the problem. Absolutely. Good example. One of the things that um, struck me on your website was that one of the predicates to recovering from wounds is a grieving process. Yeah. Now, obviously, we can, we can really help our children by using approaches like reflective listening or pointing out their emotions to them. You know, you're very... Um, you must be frustrated that you didn't get the part in the play or, or are you upset because you, you fell out with your friends. How does the grieving process look for us as adults? Um, maybe my examples of children kind of mischaracterized it or trivialized it, but actually. So what does good grieving for improving our mental condition look like? How do we do it and what are the benefits? Well, that's, once again, that's a very good and complex question. Um, I should let your viewers know that in my website, which has seven specific lessons, lesson number three uh, answers the question you just uh, raised. Uh, let me just make a few comments. Um, first, many people, no, let me start again. In my experience as a therapist, I have gradually become aware that a major source of personal and relationship and family stress is people have not finished grieving major losses. The reason they have not is that there are several factors. One is they are wounded, psychologically wounded, and they don't know it. And we wounded people, for I am one, often we, we don't know how to grieve and we're afraid of the emotions of grieving. The second reason people don't grieve well is they live in a family or a household that discourages healthy grief. If someone starts to get angry about a loss or starts to cry or needs space or um, needs to pray or whatever, um, other people in the household may feel uncomfortable with that and say, oh, get over it, snap out of it, you know, put on a happy face right now when you're talking to a three-year-old child who just lost their pet kitten, you know, put on a happy face is an incredibly wounding statement from an angry parent. So grieving is something that most people don't understand, have never studied, um, think they know how to do it, and often they don't. There are, um, let me try to be very brief, in my judgment, there are three levels to healthy grieving. One is mental one is emotional, and for some people, the third is spiritual. Each phase has phases. Example, in the emotional level of healthy grief, uh, the first phase is a feeling of disorientation and confusion and shock. The second phase, typically, is anger. The third phase is deep sadness. 
And the fourth phase is acceptance and serenity. Most people could not name those phases. There are similar phases in the other two levels. Most parents could not name these levels or phases. They, they grieve instinctively or they don't grieve. And they're without knowing it, they're not teaching their children how to grieve or how to talk about their losses. It's a big subject. Um, and I don't want to overrun our common time here, but I'm not sure if I strayed off your question or not. But to me, part of being an effective parent not only uh, involves reducing any psychological wounds you inherited and learning how to communicate effectively and teaching your children how to do that and teach, become aware of the process of grief and build what can be called a pro-PRO grief family. In other words, make it safe for the people in your home to grieve. Because if you're indifferent or you get frustrated and you get angry or you're uncomfortable when somebody's grieving, that inhibits their grief unless their true self is in charge and they are aware of the process and they intentionally seek out people who are supportive of grieving. Yes. Uh, in any event, it's a very important topic, and I refer people to Lesson 3 on my free website uh, in case they want to learn more. The question I would put to everybody who is um, viewing your channel here is, do you know how to grieve well? Have you? Are you suffering from incomplete grief? How do you know? How do you know if you are or you are not? And if you are suffering from income, no point. In my experience on this topic, which most people don't want to talk about. Sorry, um, Pete, could you just repeat the last sentence you said? Because my internet connection went funny. Okay, my questions are these. Can you define healthy grieving? Are you suffering from incomplete grief? Do you know how to judge that? If you are suffering from incomplete grief, do you know what to do about it? Um, and are you living in, especially if there are children in your home, are you living in a, fa a family that is providing the seven requisites for healthy grief? Most people cannot name the requisites. They cannot answer any of these questions. Okay. Now, I'm not so expert on grieving or how, how it should be done or anything like that. One thing I have noticed is I like to encourage people to talk a little bit about their childhood experiences so that they can get over them. And that was really obviously part of my process which helped me a lot and something I wanted to share was that people respond with things like, oh, I, I feel really guilty talking about this. That's right. And I have to sort of say, well, you know, how did that button get there? How is it How is it that whenever you talk honestly about your experiences, you have some rush of guilt? Um, because obviously that was something that was implanted if, if in, inside them in their environment because it served the false self of their abuser that they would feel guilty every time they talked about it so they wouldn't be able to talk about it. So that process of being able to talk about it and have someone empathize with you, I have noticed is incredibly cathartic to people. I've had some people say, you know, I never felt I could talk about this with anyone before. I'm so glad to meet someone who understands. And also, now that I've spoken about it with you, I feel like I could maybe speak to some of my friends about these kinds of things. So uh -huh. that's one gift that anyone listening, if they feel like they've got the emotional wherewithal, can give those that are near to be and dear to them just some empathy and understanding. Is, is, is that an example of giving someone an opportunity to grieve, to allow them to speak about it openly? It's part of it. Uh, a point I want to really emphasize is many people associate grieving with the death of someone. 
the reality is we lose important things throughout our lives, um, many things that are not the death of someone. We lose hope. We lose physical function. We lose our youth. We lose trust. Um, we, uh, we lose many things of value. We lose a relationship. Those all need as much grieving as the loss of a valued um, person or pet. Uh, I think it's really important that people understand. Uh, then I agree with the point you're making that inviting people to talk about their losses is very helpful. It's one of seven requisites that, in my judgment, and I'm obsessive on this, there are seven things that are needed for full, healthy grieving. Uh, being able to talk to somebody who can hear you and listen to you is one of the seven things. Um, I can go on and on. We probably need another interview to, to focus on all seven. But Well, I would love to uh, conduct that interview sometime in the future because it's been a real pleasure speaking to you. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. I, I appreciate the invitation, Anthony. I'm glad to do it. And I think what we can take from that is it's really important that when we're bringing up our children, we don't have these taboos of, oh, you know, big boys don't cry, or, you know, you're, you're a big girl now. But something that people often do with children is shut, it da shut down emotion and say, That's right. oh, we'll just get you a new cat which is, is very empathetic. So I think it's really important that children are able to say, yes, that's sad, that was your friend that died, you really cared about that cat. And just validate the emotions of their children because that will allow um, those emotions to be processed. What I've found is a lot of the time people really want to give advice or say to someone who's going through a difficult emotion, hey, you know, if you just look at it from this angle instead, um, you'll feel a lot better. That is so familiar, and it almost never works. What, I, what I've found is when you can just really empathize with someone and say, yeah, so you're feeling upset because you wanted X and you got Y, that encourages them to open up. And it's very similar to the digging down process you were talking about. Because when you empathize, people say, yeah, exactly, because blah, 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 blah. And you just say the same again. Yeah, and that was frustrating because such and such. And they can say, yeah, exactly. At that point, once they've dug down, it's like emotion, thought, emotion, thought, emotion, thought, like a layer cake. Once you help them get to the bottom of that by empathizing, the way that they look at the world changes of themselves. And they might say something like, well, do you know what, Pete or Anthony, I'm going to go out and get a new cat this, this weekend. Because they've managed to process the emotion in some capacity and they're ready to problem solve. I, I agree with what you say. Absolutely. Um, if their true self is in charge. Yeah, that's a very important qualification for you. Another thing that you've said um, several times in our talk here is you've used the word empathy. I had an epiphany about two years ago. Um, in my judgment, it's essential for successful relationships. I read an article on Yahoo News. Uh, it was from Time Magazine several years ago on the roots of empathy. The gist of the article was talking about bullies, bullies in schools. Um, but the the ideas in the article, which I've um, transposed to my website, I have an article on empathy, which I encourage people to read, um, because in my judgment, many people are unable to empathize. Well, my my point is, many wounded people, people who are run by false selves are unable to empathize. So I encourage you as you speak uh, your words of wisdom, and I mean that sincerely, notice when you come to the word empathy. Don't assume that other people are able to empathize, because if they're wounded, they cannot. 
or they may not be able to. Some can, some cannot. Yes, I understand that problem. And in my experience, as someone who maybe was was empathetic but didn't know how to empathize effectively and would use all these approaches of minimizing or trying to shut down or just say, you know, if you just look at it differently, then suddenly your emotion will magically disappear, you know, which is so common when you listen to the people advising other people who have an emotional pain. That's true. I, I think if people try the reflective listening technique, have you heard the old phrase, fake it till you make it? Yes. I think a lot of ground can be covered by that approach because when I discovered how much of a pleasure it was to be heart to heart with someone when I tried reflective listening gradually gradually the my emotions started turning on more I could sense them more and I could sense other people's more I totally accept that there may be people who are far more wounded than me and the fake it till you make it approach might not work for them as well as it as it did for me. But I certainly think for people who are sitting there who'd like to improve their communication skills, I'd certainly suggest they give it a try. Well, I uh, respect the learning that you have given yourself. You you know a lot from what you're saying, and I applaud you. Thank you. Um, the other thing in terms of communication that I thought of earlier, but I thought I'd, we should probably include, is really the avoidance of judgment terms as a, a way of communicating your needs. Because what I found, and I may be using a really cliched example, but supposing someone comes home late from whatever they've been doing, and their spouse says, how could you come home so late and be so selfish? I have to do everything around here. Their spouse will respond, well, I'm not selfish. I've done this and this and this. Well, you are selfish because you never do this or this or this. No, right. you're the selfish one because the first thing that happens when I come home is that you shout at me. And as soon as you throw one of those judgment terms into the mix, what tends to happen as people will debate whether the judgment is true or false, which right. takes away their focus from each of the per people's immediate needs. That's right. Yeah, very common. A, a, a major problem within the problem is that they, such people as you describe, are not aware not only of their own needs, they're not aware of their partner's needs, and they're not aware of the process that's going on between them. Um, in my judgment, uh, of seven um, essential communication skills, the very first one, the keystone skill, is awareness. So, um, to replay the example that you gave, two aware partners might sound like the person comes home late, and the spouse at home says, um, I'm feeling really frustrated because I'm feeling like you're not really caring about teamwork in our home. And I, I would like you to take more part in the tasks here around the house. And the other person would use what you say, reflective listening. I call empathic listening, same thing. So you're really upset because I've been out and you you feel you've been doing too much. That's right. And what do you need from me? I need you to want to participate more and be more aware of my feelings. Oh, okay. I'd like to do that I'm for both our benefits. I mean, I, I could go on and on with the example. But yes, I mean, it could look like the sort of, well, perhaps you could write a list of everything that needs done and I could take up some of the thing. That would be a great way to approach the situation. I'm really upset that you're homely. I felt really stressed and I have it up to here with the housework so what I've done is I've prepared a list and if you could pick up a couple of the items that would really help me the partner can say thank you I understand I'm really tired right now because I've had a long day 
But if you'd let me 45 minutes to relax, then right. I'd love to take a look at your list and see what I could do to help you take care of some things. That would be ideal. Well, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to attend this interview and share some of what you've learned um, from your experience. I think it would be really interesting for people to listen to and enlightening as well. Um, and hopefully we can speak again. Well, I'd be glad to do that. and I do appreciate the chance uh, to join you. Uh, I, I feel like we're, we're uh, very similar. So let, let's just go over a couple of links again for people so that they can access more of your work. Now, you put up a self-help program which is completely non-profit and anyone can access it. And one critical part of that is a program of advice for parents. That can be received or reached at www.sfhelp.org. You also have a YouTube channel. Um, it's kind of a strange one. Um, it's a private joke in my life. Uh, it's a takeoff on my last name. The channel is Gersakin, G-E-R-C-A-C-N, as in nickel. Um, that comes from an experience I had when I got my first formal checkbook, and I thought I had printed my last name on the application very clearly, and <laughs> obviously I hadn't because all my checks, uh, the last name was Gersakin instead of Gerlach. So I was just having a little fun in naming the channel after that memory. But that's the name of my channel, G-E-R-C-A-C-N. Fantastic. And that does form part of your overall self-help program as the videos are tools to be used in conjunction with the website. Although much of the content on there is absolutely fascinating to access, even outside of the the program itself, although perhaps that's not the most recommended use of the channel, but if people want to get a taste for what you're all about before they go ahead and start at the beginning of your program, they can do that by listening to some of your fantastic material on YouTube. Sure. Now, I'm aware that you wrote um, a great book on communications, which is called Satisfactions, which people can access. You also wrote a self-help book which should help people to negotiate with their own inner families, and that's called Who's Really Running Your Life. That's right. Are there any other books that people who might want to get a book they could be aware of? Well, I have three other books, Anthony. There's a lot that I think could be improved about them, but what I would recommend is if people are interested in... Um, Planning for or managing a step family. Lesson seven in my website is really better than any of my books. Um, I've continued to upgrade it. So I would recommend if people want to uh, help themselves or relatives or friends who are struggling in a step family or thinking about it, look at lesson seven uh, on my website. There's a lot of information there. Um, and there's a course, if there, and you can, um, there's a self-help course that you can walk through. It shows you step by step how to learn about step families. That's true of the other six lessons. One is learning how to assess your wounds and reduce them. The second lesson is about improving your communication. The third lesson is about improving your relationships of all types. The fourth lesson is how to build an effective, healthy family. The fifth lesson is, uh, I'm leaving one out, I'm afraid. Uh, the fifth lesson is about fam families. The sixth lesson is about effective parenting. The seventh lesson is about step families. There's a lot of information there. Thank you for taking the time to produce such a fantastic body of work to help people who, who want to improve their state of mind and improve the way they relate to other people. I think it's really valuable and, um, you know, people who do take the time to improve their state of mind have so much to give to others. Certainly, there's, there's no substitute for being around someone who's taken some steps and knows what the road looks like. Books are great and self-help 
YouTubes are great, but when you're you're hearing from someone who's done the work, then they can really give you guidance as as you've been doing. So people have a lot to benefit from taking your material seriously, and then they can be a shining light for the people around them and and lend a hand to the people around them. And it's a basic need for so many people to give to to do something good for the world. So. That is certainly one way that people can access their ability to do that. Well, thanks for the affirmation, and I, I once again I agree with you. My hope is that um, people who gain information from primarily the website, the videos are meant to augment the website. But for people who are visual learners, it's easier to get the ideas from the videos first. But there's much more information in the website. Um, but my hope is that as people become more aware, they will pass on their awareness to others around them, especially their children. And that way we get a ripple effect. Hopefully. Well, thank you again for joining me. It's, it's been so fantastic to speak to you. You're welcome.